This address by Helen Gu was given at the BYU Women's Conference on May 4th, 2007. My name is Sandra Rogers, a member of the Women's Conference Committee, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Sister Helen Xu Quen Quang Gu was born in China and has lived in such exotic spots as Hong Kong, Germany, and Idaho. <laughs> she currently lives in Hawaii. Sister Gu attended the Church College of Hawaii and graduated from BYU. She owns and operates her own home business. She and her husband, Charles W. H. Gu, are the parents of five children and the grandparents of eight. Sister Gu currently serves as a temple worker, teaches the Laurel class, and is the Ward Relief Society Compassionate Service Leader. We'll now be pleased to hear from Sister Gu. Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. Thank you. In the fall of 1960, an 18-year-old young man by the name of Roger from Idaho Falls, upon the persuasion of his parents, enrolled at Brigham Young, enrolled at Brigham Young University as a freshman. Once on campus, he made new friends and new commitment to church and family. During this time, he began to think about serving a mission. However, he was not sure if he should go on a mission as soon as he turned 19. That October, his parents came to attend General Conference, where Roger met them in Salt Lake City and went to conference with them. At the end of conference, as Roger and his mother were standing in the back of the tabernacle waiting for his father, they were watching the general authorities walk past as they exited the tabernacle. It was especially thrilling to see the prophet David O. McKay. As Roger stood there, a thought came to his mind. If he could shake hands with the prophet, it would be an acknowledgement that he should do all he can to serve a mission. President McKay was so loved that there was a large crowd of saints waiting to see him. Some of those in the front rows were able to shake his hand. Roger was standing a couple of rows back, but as President McKay was about to get into his waiting car, he turned around and reached his hand over the crowd and shook Roger's hand. On December 13, 1960, Roger received his mission call to the Southern Far East Mission with headquarters in Hong Kong. Little did Roger know at that time his decision to serve a mission would have great impact in my life. In faraway China, when I was eight years old, my parents left in a hurry for Hong Kong to escape, escape the communist invasion of our city. I was left behind with my aunt, who was my mother's youngest sister. A year later, my parents met a woman who was taking her daughter back to China to live while she would return to Hong Kong to work. My parents asked the woman if she would bring me to Hong Kong using her daughter's passport, and the woman accepted the assignment and a sum of money for this favor. I remember my aunt telling me about this woman and helped me to memorize the name of the little girl and instructed me that I would be using that name when I crossed the border to Hong Kong with this woman to be reunited with my family. It was a joyous occasion when I finally arrived in Hong Kong to live with my family. When I was 12 years old, I met the missionaries through a classmate, Anna. I was then attending a Lutheran school in which my mother was a member of their congregation. I often go to, went to church with my mom, but I never felt I belonged. One day, as Anna and I were walking home from school, we saw two American young men walking toward us. Surprisingly, Anna greeted them, being that I came from China, where I was taught that Americans were evil people. I stood aside and didn't want to have anything to do with these guailos, which means foreign devils. <laughs> but Anna brought, me, brought them to me, and they shook my hand and spoke to me in Cantonese. They proceeded to tell me about a prophet named Joseph Smith. I have been taught that the Bible was the only scripture and the name Joseph Smith could not be found in the Bible. And as a result, I rejected the message and other missionaries as well. One night, two missionaries knocked on our door and asked for me. Surprisingly, my mother allowed them in. One of the elders told me that from the record, he could see that I have gone through several sets of missionaries, and he wanted to know what my problem was. 
I told him that I could not accept Joseph Smith as a prophet, and he asked if I had read the Book of Mormon and pray about it. I said no, and he challenged me to do so in order for me to find out if it is true. I wanted to get rid of them, so I promised them that I would study and pray about it. That night as I got into bed to sleep, I thought of my promise to them. I got up and started to read the Book of Mormon. Afterwards, I knelt down to pray sincerely to the Lord, asking if this was true. Nothing spectacular happened, but I did feel a sense of peace and serenity. As I continued to study and pray, I became a very active non-member of the branch. I was asked to help with the primary children every Saturday by rounding up the children and taking them on the bus to church to attend primary. I would save my daily allowance for my breakfast and lunch so that I had money to help pay for the bus fare for some of them. The chapel soon became my second home. After a while, my mother began to resent the church while occupying so much of my time. Her ministers took advantage of her discontent to tell her a falsehood about Mormonism. This upset her, upset her even more, and she started to restrict my church, church activities. In those days, church was held in two sessions, Sunday school in the morning and sacrament in the afternoon. I was only allowed to go to one, but not both. It was very difficult for me, as I was a translator in Sunday school class, and then I was a chorister for sacrament meeting. I just had to go to both of them. From then on, I had to be extra good around the house. On Sundays, I would get up very early and did all the chores in order to put my mother in a position that she really could not refuse to let me go to church. After Sunday school, I would just stay in the chapel and wait for sacrament meeting in the afternoon. I knew that if I went home, my mother would not let me go out again. From, that, from that, that time on, whenever my mother was upset with me, I would find the door locked upon my return from church, and there would not be any dinner. My church friends would buy me some bread to eat while I waited outside the door until my father let me in. As I was going through this difficult time, my desire to be baptized increased each day. After I listened to the 18 discussions, I knew I wanted to be a member of the church, of the true church. When the missionary challenged me to be baptized, I told them that I had to wait because I knew my parents would not sign the permission form. A short time later, I overheard my parents making plans to go to Macau to visit an aging aunt. An idea came to my mind, and the next day I told the missionaries that I could be baptized on Saturday. The night before my baptism, I packed my little Waker school basket with a towel and a change of clothes. Well, like many things in life, this event did not work out as smoothly as planned. My parents su surprised us and returned home a day early on Friday night. I was determined to go ahead with my baptism. The next morning, I told my mother that I was going swimming. <laughs> I met Anna at the bus stop, and we took the bus to the mission home where the baptism would take place in the swimming pool. When the missionaries asked for my permission to slip, I told them that my parents had gone to Macau. Seeing that I was such a faithful and earnest non-member, they believed me. On August 1st, 1958, I was baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Following the baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, I realized that I should be honest with my parents. I waited until my mother had gone to bed, and then I told my father about it. Being an understanding man, he told me that he knew how much I loved the church, and he, his only request was that I would not do anything to bring shame to the family name. I'm one of those blessed with great enthusiasm for almost everything in life, and missionary work was no exception. I felt I could save the world. My enthusiasm caused me a great deal of trials in my life. The Lutheran school I was attending became very concerned over the lack of attendance in their own Sunday school meetings. Upon further investigation, they discovered that Anna, Anna and I had been taking our classmates to our church, to Sunday school, and to MIA. <laughs> they decided to take action against us. On Easter Sunday, 1960, following the mandatory Sabbath worship for all the students, the principal announced that Anna and I were to come to his office immediately after the meeting. To our astonishment, we were advised that we were being expelled from school. No explanation, no consultation with parents. We were just expelled. We were devastated. We had disgraced our families. 
When I notified the branch president, he called the mission office and President Taylor sent missionaries to see the principal. And eventually they were told that Anna and I were expelled because we were communists. When evening came and my father was alone, I told him what had happened to me in school. My father was very disappointed with me, but told me not to let my mom know and he went about securing a tutor for both Anna and I. We would meet at the chapel every day for our lessons until my father secured a slot for me in another high school. Eventually, my mother found out and I was punished for disobeying her. Life was not good for me at home. I felt a sense of hopelessness among my relatives who regarded me as an outcast. At the age of 16, I was set apart as primary president and that kept me happy in my life. Each day I faced my life with faith in my Heavenly Father, knowing truly that I was His daughter and that He loved me. Just that knowledge alone has helped me to feel my worth and to live each day with hope for a brighter future. As a sacrament chorister, I worked with the pianist Elder Roger Rommel from Idaho Falls. He could only play eight, play eight hymns on the piano, and every Sunday we sang those eight hymns. Elder Romer was a very compassionate person and perceptive to my situation. He asked if I would like to go to Idaho to live with his family and finish my education. He said he had five brothers and they have always wanted a sister. And so at the age of 17 on September of 1962, I left Hong Kong. Many of my primary children came to the airport and they presented me with a doll. I clutched the door and left behind a difficult situation and went on to begin a new life with my hands in the hands of my Heavenly Father. I'm grateful for my simple faith that comes from knowing in my heart that Heavenly Father will, will watch over me. I'm not saying that I was not afraid. I cried all the, all the way from Hong Kong to Tokyo. At long last, I arrived in the Idaho Falls Airport and the Rommel's along with Sister Long, who has served her mission in Hong Kong, met me at the airport and embraced me with love. I felt instantly that I was, I was part of their family. On the way to their home, I asked if I could see the Idol Falls Temple. When I saw the temple, I felt so much peace and happiness in my heart. I knew I belonged to the true Church of God. In the spring of 1964, when I was a senior at Idaho Falls High School, and Dad Romrell was a member of the Stick Presidency and often had meetings with the church leaders. During one of his meetings in Salt Lake City, Elder Hinckley asked what my plans were after high school. Dad Romrell told him that I was going to enroll in Rick's College. President Hinckley replied, no, I want Helen to go to Church College of Hawaii, where she will meet and marry her own. When Dad returned home and told me what President Hinckley said, I told him I will go to Church College of Hawaii. The summer after my freshman year in college, I met a young man of Chinese ancestry, Charles Gu, who was born and raised in Hawaii. He was attending BYU and was home teacher to my friends from Idaho Falls. They told him to look me up when he came home for the summer. Shortly after we met, he was called to serve his mission in Hong Kong. We corresponded for two and a half years, and after his mission, we were married in the Hawaiian temple. I'm grateful for his faith and his commitments to the gospel, and because of that, I have had the privilege of supporting him in many church callings. Serving side by side with my husband has given me opportunities to grow in the gospel. Through these choice experiences, I have gained greater love for my Heavenly Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and my brothers and sisters throughout the world. We raised five wonderful children, three daughters and two sons, and each of them have served missions. Four of them are married and are married in the temple to worthy individuals. They are the crowning joy in our lives along with our great grand, eight grandchildren. I'm thankful for President Hinckley for his love and concern for me, and because I listen and follow his counsel, my life has been blessed. When we choose to exercise our faith, we be, can become instrument in God's hand to bring about his purposes and to bless his children. Roger Rommel exercised his faith in Heavenly Father. A living prophet who was in tune with the Spirit reached out to shake Roger's hand, and I became the recipient of that act of faith. I was able to come to America to live and to practice my religion without persecution. 
During my years in Idaho Falls, I learned from Mom Romero's examples of a supportive wife to a BC church leader, which later in my life I found the same joy in supporting a BC husband in his church assignments. It was not by a coincidence, it was not a coincidence that I was led to live with the Romero's. It was by divine intervention that I went there to live and to learn what a Latter day Saint family is all about. I'm grateful for a loving Heavenly Father who knows what trainings I would need to better prepare for my future. Faith allows miracles like this to happen. Our living prophet, Person Hinckley, desires that we increase in faith. These are the words that spoken from his heart to our Heavenly Father on our behalf. Father, increase our faith of of all our needs, I think the greatest is an increase in faith. And so, dear Father, increase our faith in Thee, in Thy beloved Son, in Thy great eternal work, in ourselves as Thy children, and in our capacity to go and do our calling to Thy will and Thy precepts. As I read this prayer, I can see in my eyes, mind's eyes our beloved prophet at the age of 96, kneeling down by his bed and pouring out his heart to God to implore him to bless us with increase in faith. It brought tears to my eyes just to feel that great love President Hinckley has for us. Our prophet knows the increase in faith is needed in our times as we, as we face the uncertainty of our future in these troubled times. Let us honor our prophet and strive to increase our faith in God and his son, Jesus Christ. What is faith? The prophet Joseph Smith taught that faith is the first principle in revealed religion and the foundation of all righteousness. And he explained that faith is the assurance we have of the existence of unseen things. And being the assurance, faith must be the principle of action in all intelligent beings. President Hinckley observed, when I discuss faith, I do not mean it in an abstract sense. I mean it as a living vital force with recognition of God as our Father and Jesus as our Savior. When we accept this basic premise, there will come an acceptance of the teachings and an obedience which will bring peace and joy in this life and exaltation in life to come. Faith in the Chinese language is made up of two characters. The first character is Sun, which means believe. The second character is some, which is the heart. In, our, in other words, faith comes from a believing heart. We often hear people say, if your heart is in it, you will do fine, but if your heart is not in it, you won't succeed. A believing heart is the motivating force that leads us to do good and to live virtuous lives. Therefore, it is extremely important that we nurture our hearts with knowledge of the divinity of our Father in heaven and the Savior Jesus Christ. Sisters, we must check our hearts regularly and ask ourselves these questions. Do I know the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ live and they lives and they love me? Do I know that Jesus Christ died and atoned for my sin? Do I know that I am a daughter of God? Do I know that God is at the helm and he knows what is best for his children? Do I listen and obey the counsel of our living prophet, President Gordon B. Hinckley? Do I live the gospel in the best of my ability? If by any chance our answers are not affirmative, then it is time to humble ourselves and follow these guidelines in the book of Helaman. Nevertheless, they did fast and pray oft, and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility, and faith, firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ, unto the filling their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and the sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. We can reclaim our faith and work toward our eternal progression. The plan of salvation begins with faith and continues by increasing in faith. Every blessing that comes into our lives is the result of, ex of exercising our faith in God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. One of my favorite Book of Mormon stories is the account of the 2,000 young warriors. These young men told Helaman that they had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them, and that they also added that they do not know their mothers knew it. I often wonder what manner of women were their mothers. What did they do to raise their sons with such faith and courage? So great were their faith that it brought down the power of heaven for their protection. 
I don't have all the answers, but I'm certain that these women were of great faith and they taught by their examples. I imagine that if they were living today, they would show faith in all the programs of the church, such as primary, young women and young men, and by supporting their children in their activities. They would know the scouting programs in order to encourage and support their sons to achieve the highest rank of Eagle Scouts. They would learn the duties of the officers in the priesthood and see to it that their son performed their duties in exactness as they advance in the priesthood. If they have daughters, I would think that they would learn the young woman values with their daughters and align their teachings at home with these values. I'm sure they see to it that they have family prayer daily, family home evening weekly, and scripture study daily as well. I imagine they bear their personal testimony to their children regularly. I'm sure they taught compassion to their children by the many hours of compassionate service they perform with joy, joyful hearts. These faithful converted Lamanite mothers did a marvelous job in instilling faith in their sons, and we salute them for their great achievement. Now it is our turn as we have come for such a time as this. We too will dedicate our lives in bringing up generations of youth who will be worthy sons and daughters of God. As we live our lives with faith in our hearts and our children will recognize our faith, and they will not doubt that we know God lives and Jesus is his son, and that this church is true. Quite a few years ago, a member of our ward, Sister Baker, had a brain tumor, and it was announced in church that our ward would fast and pray for her. On Monday, as she went into surgery, 